My name is Bill Graham. Welcome back to Bill Graham Music. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about some jazz standards. If you're just starting to learn how to play jazz, the sheer number of tunes you're expected to know how to play can seem a little overwhelming, as can all the different recordings you need to be aware of on each tune. I've put together a list of 25 jazz standards you need to learn, starting from tunes with the simplest harmonic relationships and getting increasingly harmonically complex as well as a playlist where I've suggested five different recordings of each tune to check out. There's a link to that playlist in the description. I'm also going to give you a brief overview of the chord progression to each tune. Since I don't want this video to be two hours long, I'm going to try and keep it relatively short on each tune, but I'm also planning on doing a series of videos where I'll go in depth on improvising and comping on each tune individually. First, a definition is in order. When I say jazz standards, what I'm talking about is the body of tunes written by non-jazz musician pop songwriters, generally for either Broadway or Hollywood musicals from roughly the 1920s through 1950s, which were then picked up on by jazz musicians as familiar vehicles over which to improvise. These are pop tunes with lyrics, which the general audience at the time would have been familiar with. This body of tunes is also commonly referred to as the Great American Songbook. I'll be doing another video with a list of 25 important instrumental jazz tunes to learn, where I'll go over that other important body of work, instrumental jazz compositions by jazz musicians, which we also need to know plenty of. So, why do we need to learn all these old tunes? There are a couple of very important reasons. Number one, these tunes are the common language that we use to improvise over. If you're at a jazz jam session anywhere in the world, presuming there are jazz jam sessions again, at some point in the future, you should be able to call any one of these tunes, and even if you've never met the musicians you're about to play with, because you all know all these tunes, you can instantly start making music and communicating with one another. Number two, these tunes teach us so much about harmony. All the cool harmonic moves that you could ever want to know about are built right into these songs, both the original chord progressions and the common practice jazz reharmonizations of them. Also, the more of these tunes you learn, the easier it gets to learn more of them, because you start to really see and understand the common patterns which come up over and over again in tune after tune. A quick note on how I selected these recordings. Obviously, they have to currently, as of October 2020 when I'm making this video, be available on YouTube for you to listen to. I wanted to cover as relatively wide an array of historically important players as I could, while at the same time generally sticking to players who played relatively traditional language for you to absorb. This has unfortunately resulted in a lot of very fine modern players being either left out or underrepresented. If a player isn't on this list, please don't take it personally. It doesn't mean that I don't like them. If your favorite version of a tune isn't here, let me know in the comments. I've limited myself to suggesting five recordings of each tune, but please don't stop there. Keep exploring and digging into as many different versions of each of these tunes by as many different musicians as you can. First, I've selected two vocal recordings of every tune. One pop vocal recording and one jazz vocal recording. This generally but not always means one orchestrated and arranged vocal version and one version with a jazz singer uh, with a small group, you know, just a rhythm section. It's important to check out vocal recordings of these tunes to really get a sense of where they come from and how all the classic jazz musicians and audiences would have originally been aware of these tunes. I've also put three instrumental recordings of each tune by reputable jazz improvisers on the list. Now with all of that out of the way, let's dive right into the first tune. The first tune we're going to talk about is Autumn Leaves. This is about as simple as it gets for a standard generally played in the key of G minor and is essentially just a 2-5-1 in the relative major and then the 2-5-1 in the tonic minor. So we're in the key of G minor, the relative major is B flat. So we're going to have the A section is a 2-5-1 in B flat, that's C minor 7 to F7 to B flat major 7. Then we continue around the diatonic circle of fourths, go to E flat major 7. Another fifth, we're on A minor 7 flat 5. This is the 2 chord of the tonic minor, of G minor. So remember, we started out with a 2 5 1 in B flat. This is a 4 chord in B flat. Now we've got a 2 5 1 in G minor. That's 
A minor 7 flat 5, to D7, to G minor 6. Um, at least, this is the difference between the 50s and the 60s, right? If it's the 50s, you're going to play G minor 6, and if it's the 60s, you're going to play G minor 7, or G minor 9, something like that. Okay, so that's our first 8-bar phrase. We're going to play that again. 2, 5, 1, in B flat, to the 4. 2, 5, 1, in G minor. Now the B section just reverses those two two fives. It starts off with the two five to G minor, then the two five to B flat, E flat, another two five to G minor, and usually in the fake books there's going to be a bunch of chords here. Those are substitutions that you can but don't have to play. All the harmony really is here is G minor six, and then the bass moves down to E. So it's still a G minor 6 chord, but now because the E is in the bass, it's E minor 7 flat 5. Then we finish up with one final 2 5 1 back to G minor. That's the whole tune. The versions that I've put on the playlist for you to check out are, first of all, a ballad recording with orchestra by Nat King Cole then a small group recording uh, a little bit more up-tempo swinging by Tony Bennett, and then three instrumental versions. First of all, a very iconic recording, the Cannonball Adderley record, Something Else, from 1958, with Miles Davis on trumpet and Hank Jones on piano. Then the Bill Evans Portrait and Jazz recording from 1959 with the classic trio with Paul Motion on drums and Scott LaFaro on bass. Also, a more straight-ahead swingin' version by Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt from the record Boss Tenors from 1961. It's not available on YouTube, but if you've got the Keith Jarrett Live at the Blue Note 1994 box set, the version of Autumn Leaves on that record, particularly the intro, is just unbelievably great. So check that out if you can. The next tune we're going to take a look at is Take the A Train. This is another one that couldn't be much simpler generally played in the key of C, and the form is A, A, B, A. So the A sections start with two bars of the one chord, C6. C6 for two bars, and then we're going to have two bars of five of five. So in the key of C, the five chord is G7. In the key of G, the five chord is D7. So we're borrowing that D7 from the key of G, the five chord, so we call it five of so we got C6 for two bars, one chord for two bars, five of five for two bars, and then it could pass straight to the five chord, but jazz musicians, generally speaking, like to put a lot of two chords in front of five chords. So anytime you've got a five chord, you can pretty much put a two chord in front of it. So what we generally play here after the five of five, D7, is it's going to pass through two now, D minor seven going to G7, back to 1, 6. This is shorthand. It's actually more technically accurate to call it 5 of 2, but we uh, generally use the shorthand of just calling it the 6 chord. Uh, but then after that, 5 of 2 is going to go to 2, 5. So one more time, that was the 1 chord for 2 bars, 5 of 5 for 2 bars, section, then we're going to do it again. But the second time, instead of having that 1, 6, 2, 5 at the end, the bridge starts on the 4 chord. So we're going to change from the 1 to 5 of 4. That means we're going from C6 to C7. And the point of that C7 is to set up the 4 chord, F6, that the bridge starts on. Okay? So we're going to hang out on F6 for 4 bars. 3, 4, now we go to D7, play that same 5 of 5 move, pass through 2, 5, that's our bridge, and we got one more A section. Two bars of the 1 chord, two bars of 5 of 5, one bar of 2, one bar of 5, 1, 5 of 2, 2, 5, 1. Or any kind of turnaround, that could be 3, 6, 2, 5. Any kind of turnaround, doesn't matter. The recordings that I've put on the playlist for you to check out are, first of all, the original Ellington recording 
from 1941. Now, generally speaking, I'm giving you a pop recording that has vocals, but because the original recording of this one is instrumental, uh, I thought it was important for us to check that one out first. Then also another version, also with the Ellington Orchestra, but this time with Ella Fitzgerald singing from 1957. So the three instrumental versions that we're going to check out are, first of all, the 1955 version by the Clifford Brown Max Roach Quintet off of the record Study in Brown. Then a, uh, a version by David Fathead Newman on tenor sax, Hank Crawford on alto sax, and Kenny Burrell on guitar, live from a festival in France, 1977, I believe. Um, and a really cool version by the Charles Mingus Sextet from 1964, where it's you know, it might strike you as being pretty far out at first, but really listen, it's, it's really happening. They play in the whole history of jazz up till that point when it was recorded in it. Uh, the piano player Jackie Byard is playing stride piano, but it's modern stride piano. And then Eric Dolphy plays this incredible bass clarinet solo on it, which again, sounds pretty far out, but he's really making the changes and playing the form. So it's really cool. I really recommend you picking it out and checking that out because it's really awesome. Next up, we're going to talk about I've Got Rhythm, the chord progression of which is often referred to as rhythm changes. So this is another A-A-B-A -A -A tune, generally played in B-flat. The A section is a simple one, six, two, five, and then another one, six, two, five. Although often that second one, six, two, five is played as a three, six, or dominant, so it's really five of two. Three, five of two, two, five. All right, then we get back to our one, turn it. We're heading towards the four chord, so we're going to play five of four, B flat seven, go to the four, E flat six, and then there are a couple options here. Uh, I tend to prefer the minor four, E flat minor six, but a lot of times people will go to the sharp four diminished diminished 7, which is just a common tone diminished of the tonic. See, what's going to happen is this E diminished 7 is going to go up into B flat 6, except with the F in the bass generally. So we've got another 1, 6, or again, it's dominant, so it's really 5 of 2, 2, 5. That's our first A section. Then we play another A section, 1, 6, 2, is a dominant chain. So we're trying to get back to B flat, right? So if you think about it, the five of B flat is F7. And the five of F7, the five of F, is C7. And the five of C is G7. And the five of G is D7. So we're gonna cycle from D7 to G7 to C7 to F7 to get us back to B flat. All right, D7, so this is five of six, or you could think of it as five of five of five of five, to our G7, which is, you could think of that as five of two, or five of five of five, <coughs> takes us to C7, five of five, and finally, that takes us back to F7, which is our five chord. And then we've got one more A section to cap off the tune. One, six, two, five. Three, six, two, five. One, five of four, four, minor four. Now, in the original changes, this is rarely played by jazz musicians this way, but in the original version, it goes one, flat seven dominant, which is really tritone sub for five of six, into six dominant, which is again five of two, two, five, one. Now we generally don't put that little tag at the end. We just get to the end of it and we say one, five of four, four, minor four, one, six, two, five, one. Wrap it up. 
So that seems like a lot of chords to have in a relatively easy tune, right? So why do I have this song so early in the list? It's because even though it does have relatively a lot of chords, it covers relatively few key areas. It really is just hanging out in B flat for a long time. The A section is just essentially hanging out in B flat, and then it heads towards the four for a second. Um, and then the bridge is that dominant chain. But other than that, the A section is essentially just B flat. So back when I was a chord scale player, and I was trying to assign a different scale to every single chord, it seemed impossible to play rhythm changes. But as soon as I started learning about key centers and playing chord tones and all the Barry Harris stuff, too, of course, all that made it super easy to play. So I think of it now as a pretty easy tune to play. All right, so now let's talk about the versions that I've put on the playlist for you to check out. First up is a version of Judy Garland singing it in the film version of the original musical it came from, Girl Crazy. In the original Broadway version, it was sung by Ethel Merman, but I'm not going to subject you to that. Next, we're going to listen to another vocal version by Fats Waller from 1935. Then we're going to get into some what are called contrafacts. And what contrafacts are, are when jazz musicians would take an existing chord progression of a standard tune and write a new melody to go over top of it. And so we're going to look at three different rhythm changes contrafacts. The first of those we're going to check out is Lester Young with Count Basie doing a tune called Lester Leaps In in 1939. Then we're going to look at Bud Powell doing a Charlie Parker rhythm changes head called Anthropology in 1962, live in France. And then finally we're going to look at a Thelonious Monk rhythm changes contrafact called Rhythmining. And this is from a live album at the Five Spot from 1958 featuring Johnny Griffin on tenor sax. The next tune we're going to take a look at is Bye Bye Blackbird. This tune is usually played in the key of F, and it's also an A-A-B-A -A -A form, but this one's a little bit unusual because even though the melody is clearly A-A-B-A, -A -A, the harmony of each A section is slightly different. So if you didn't know the melody, you were just looking at the changes, you might think, what is this, A-B-C-D? But if you listen to the melody, you'll understand it's really an A-A-B-A -A -A form. So it starts off on the tonic, we're in F. We got an F6. Then we got a two, G minor seven, to C7, five, one. Another bar of the one. And then check this out, three, flat three diminished. That's A minor seven, A flat diminished. Because of the melody note, it's actually A flat diminished major seven. That doesn't really matter. Two, G minor seven. 5, C7. Now the next A section starts on the 2 chord, G minor 7. So a lot of times we're going to set that up with a D7 chord, 5 of 2. And now take a look at how the melody is shifted up a step diatonically. This is really just 4 bars of G minor 7. A lot of times there'll be a, what we call a line cliche running through this. So you might have like G minor to G minor major seven to G minor seven to G minor six, but it's really just all the two chords still hanging out on G minor. Two, five, one. Next we get an F7 chord. Now normally, if we're in the key of F and we see an F7 chord, we think, hey, this has got to be five of four, right? But I actually don't hear this one like that. I hear this as a bluesism, making it a bluesy dominant sound on the tonic. Then we've got a two five into the two. So that's A minor seven flat five to D seven to the two, G minor seven. Minor four, we got B flat minor six, to C seven. Now we get to our last A section. F six again, the tonic. A two five into the two, A half diminished to D seven. Two, five.
first version you're going to check out is a more arranged version with Julie London singing. And then you're going to hear a version with Carmen McRae fronting the Count Basie Orchestra sometime in the 70s. And you'll get to really hear what a jazz singer sounds like in comparison with a pop singer singing the same material. Now we're going to look at some instrumental versions, starting with an extremely iconic recording from Miles Davis's first great quintet from the album Round About Midnight. This, of course, features John Coltrane on tenor saxophone, Red Garland on piano, Paul Chambers on bass, and Philly Joe Jones on drums. Next, we're going to look at uh, a version by another great trumpet player, Clark Terry, with Bob Brookmeyer on valve trombone and Hank Jones again on piano from a record called Gingerbread Men from 1966. And finally, we're going to take a look at a Keith Jarrett trio recording live in Japan from 1993. Next, we're going to talk about a tune that was very popular with swing players and early bebop players, but has kind of fallen off the map a little bit, and that's Oh Lady Be Good. This tune is typically played in G, and is another A-A-B-A -A -A form. So the A section starts on the one chord, G6, and then it goes to the four, but it's dominant. This is, again, just a bluesy chord, just like that F7 in Bye Bye Blackbird. And the rhythm section is generally going to go from the C7 to C sharp diminished. Back to G6. That's the one chord again. That C sharp diminished is another common tone diminished, right? Because C sharp diminished is the same thing as G diminished. We're in the key of G. That C sharp diminished leads into a G6 chord. Okay, so we had our one, four dominant in the rhythm section, but you don't have to play that as a soloist. Back to G6. One, three, six. Again, this is a dominant six, so this is five of two. Go into two, five, one, six, two, five. That's our A section. Then we get another A section. One, C7 to C sharp diminished, four dominant to sharp four diminished. One, tone, or maybe even flat three diminished a lot of the time. You'll hear maybe like one in first inversion to flat three diminished to two. These are just some different harmonic options that you've got here. It's not set in stone. Five, one. And now we're heading to the bridge, and the bridge starts on the four chord. So just like in Take the A Train, we're going to put a five of four in this key that's G7 that leads to four. Here we are at the bridge, C6, it's a four chord, sharp four diminished, C sharp diminished, which does that exact same move of coming up to G6 again, the tonic. Now we're going to have a 2-5 into the six. Since we're in G, the six is E minor, so that means we've got F sharp half diminished to B7 into E minor seven to now five of five, A7, and that's interrupted by two, A minor seven, to five, D7. And then we've got one more A section at the end of that. G6, one, to C7, C sharp diminished, G6. Maybe put a C in the bass, make it a four chord for a second. Go to that three or one in first inversion. Flat three diminished, or five, or tritone sub of five, whatever you're feeling, doesn't matter, to two, five, one. Maybe a little turnaround to get back around to the top. Both of the vocal recordings that I've got for you here are by Ella Fitzgerald, because this is a tune that is very closely associated with her. The first one is a ballad recording arranged by Nelson Riddle from 1959. And then another one is a live recording with the Basie Orchestra from the early 70s, I believe. And um, remember I was talking about that blues chord. The, the blues lineage is important in this tune. And in fact, in that Basie version, they start off with a couple of choruses of blues before she comes in. Then the instrumental versions that we're looking at, first of all, there's a Benny Goodman trio 
version from 1936. This is really early, but um, the Benny Goodman Trio is an important group. It was one of the first integrated jazz groups, and it's got Teddy Wilson on piano, the amazing Teddy Wilson on piano, Gene Krupa on drums, and Benny Goodman, of course, on clarinet. Very cool music, no bass player. Teddy Wilson's playing everything with his left hand. Check out the key changes in this version. It's interesting. They start in G, and then for the piano solo, they go up a half step to A flat. And then for the clarinet solo, they go up another whole step to B flat. And then for the out head, it's actually really interesting. They do this kind of minor key variation in C minor. And then finally, at the bridge and the last head, they move back into C major. Um, but so that's interesting. There's a key change every chorus. Next is a very important recording by Lester Young, again with Count Basie. And finally, a version of Dexter Gordon and Sonny Stitt. This is an unreleased recording, but it's really happening. It's got Don Patterson on organ and Billy James on drums. I think you'll really enjoy it. The next tune we're gonna look at is Back Home Again in Indiana. All the songs we've looked at so far have been in the form A-A-B-A, -A -A, which is far and away the most common form for a 32-bar Tin Pan Alley-style pop song to be in. But this song is in the other common form, A-B-A-C. It's another 32-bar form, still has four phrases, but instead of the first phrase twice, a bridge, and then a return to the first phrase, we've got the first phrase, a second phrase, the first phrase again, but modified, and then an ending phrase. This is another common form. So this tune is commonly played in the keys of A flat and F. We're gonna look at an A flat today. And first I'm gonna show you the swing era changes, the just basic chords, and then we're gonna go back and fill in the bebop extra two chords, basically. So, like I said, we're playing an A flat. Starts on the one, and then we've got a little quick dominant chain where we've got the five of two, but it's really five of five of five because it doesn't go to two, it goes to five of five, and then that goes to five, back to one. A flat six, F seven, B flat seven, E flat seven, back to A flat six. Now we're heading towards the four chord. So we're gonna turn this A flat six, we're gonna change it from the one to the five of four. So we can go to D flat six, which is the four chord. Then we're gonna turn it into the minor four. Go back to one. Do that quick little dominant chain again. Five of five of five. Five of five. And now we're back to our second A section, which starts the same as the first A, but then continues a little bit different. One, five of five of five, five of five. But then check this out, this resolves deceptively up to now five of six, going to six. Back to five of six, six, five of six, six. Here we've got flat three diminished, which is behaving a little bit differently than it normally does. Normally flat three diminished leads to two, but in this case, it's just acting as a common tone diminished of the one, and watch this. It just goes straight to A flat six. And we've got another quick one, five of two. This time it's an actual two. So those are the basic swing era changes. Now when you get to the bebop era, people just started adding a couple of extra two chords to it. So now, starts off the same. One, five of five of five, to five of five. But now we're gonna interrupt that with a two, five, one. And instead of just having five of four, we're gonna have a two five into four. So that's going to be E flat minor 7 to A flat 7 to D flat major. And then we're going to have D flat minor 6 
or even D flat minor seven to G flat seven. That would be what we call a backdoor two five. Back to A flat six, F seven, five of five of five, five of five, B flat seven. But now we're gonna interrupt it to five. Second A section, A flat six again, one to the five of five of five, F seven, B flat seven. But now instead of just going straight C seven to F minor, we're gonna make it a two five into F minor. G half diminished to C seven into F minor six. C seven, F minor six. Five, F minor six, that same diminished, flat three diminished, leading into one, six, or five of two, two, five, one. Also, a lot of the times that last phrase will actually be three, six, two, five, one. All right. So the first version that I've put on the list for you to check out is a really corny sing-along version from the beginning of the Indy 500 car race. And then there's a really cool version by the country and pop singer and guitar player, session player, uh, Glenn Campbell, fronting a big band in the early 70s on a variety show on TV, and he's really burning on it. It's pretty cool. Then we've got a Louis Armstrong recording from 1951. Louis played this tune every night for about 20 years, but this is the first known recording uh, of him playing it. In later years, he kind of established a set solo that he played on it, but he's really improvising here. It's cool to check out. Then we've got a version of Bud Powell playing it. He's playing it in the key of F. Lewis played it in A flat. Bud Powell's playing it in F. A really killer Bud Powell trio version from 1947. And then also from 47, a contrafact of Charlie Parker. It's actually written by Miles Davis, but it's clearly constructed of a bunch of Charlie Parker phrases that Miles had learned or transcribed, whatever, while he was playing with them. And that tune is Donna Lee. That's in A-flat again. Next tune we're going to take a look at is Alone Together. This is generally played in D minor, and it starts off with a little chord change that we haven't dealt with yet. And that's a 1 6 2 5 in minor. So D minor 6 to B minor 7 flat 5. That's 1 to 6, but it's the same chord. It's the same chord, but now the 6th is in the bass. And then we've got our 2 5, E half diminished, to A7. So that's our 1 6 2 5 in D minor. D minor 6. Half diminished, E half diminished, A7. All right, that's what we're going to start the A section of alone together with. So we've got our one, six, two, five, and then we do it again. One, six, two, five. Back to one. Now check this out. We're going to have a two, five into our minor four. So that means A half diminished to D7. G minor 6. Now this next chord is really interesting because it's a secondary flat 3 diminished. Remember we're in the key of D minor and the relative major of D minor is F major. So we're going to play the flat 3 diminished of F. That's A flat diminished. And then we continue in F for a minute. We've got our 2, 5, 1 into F. So that was our relative major. And then what looks like it's going to be a 2-5 back into D minor, but suddenly it ends on a surprise parallel major chord. goes to D major 7. That's our A section. We're going to do that again. 1, 6, 2, 5. 1, 6, 2, 5. 1, 2, 5 into the 4. diminished of the relative major, 2-5 into the relative major, minor 2-5 into surprise major tonic. All right, here comes the bridge. 
we've got another 2-5 into that minor 4. And then this turns from G minor 6 into G minor 7 flat 5. So it does the same thing down a whole step, right? G minor 7 flat 5 to C7. This, you would expect, since it's a minor 2-5, that it would want to go to F minor, right? But it goes to F major. So that's just like the surprise minor 2-5 to parallel major move from the end of the A section. Another 2-5 back into D minor. All right, our last A section is similar to the first two, but it's really just kind of this vamp. The last time, instead of the two chord, it's going to be this flat six dominant, which is a chord from the minor blues. It's really the tritone sub for five of five, but it's a very common chord in minor blues. It's going to go from this B flat seven, flat six dominant to five. A very common jazz reharmonization is to take that A flat diminished from the A sections and reconceive of that as being okay, so if A flat diminished, that could be E7 flat 9. Well, what two chord goes in front of E7? B minor 7 goes to E7. So a lot of times you'll hear what sounds like a disconnected 2 5 at that point in the chord progression. You'll Suddenly, it sounds like a 2-5, a major third away from where it should have been before it gets to that 2-5 to F. And it does kind of sound a little disconnected, but that's the lineage of it, is the original diminished chord was reharmonized. So the recordings that we're going to check out are the original hit version from 1932 by the Leo Reisman Orchestra, then a Joe Williams vocal recording from 1961. Joe Williams is a singer that was closely associated with the Basie Orchestra for a long time. Then there's a cool version by Kenny Dorham with Tommy Flanagan on piano from 1959, a killer version by Sonny Stitt from 56, and a version by the great guitar player Pat Martino from 1972. The next tune we're going to talk about is Misty. Now Misty is usually played in E flat, A A B A tune, starts on the one chord, and then there's an immediate 2-5 into the four. So if we're in E flat, that means we start on E flat major seven, then we got B flat minor seven to E flat seven to A flat major, and then a backdoor 2-5. What a backdoor 2-5 is, is a 2-5 in the relative major of the parallel minor. So E flat major, parallel minor is E flat minor, relative major of E flat minor is G flat major, okay? The 2-5 in G flat is A flat minor 7 to D flat 7. And then that surprise resolves up through what we call the back door from D flat 7, from that flat 7 dominant compared to the key that you're in, to the 1. Then we've got a 1, 6, 2, 5, a quick little dominant chain. G7, that's 5 of 5 of 5 of 5, to C7, 5 of 5 of 5, F7, 5 of 5, B flat 7, 5. And then we've got that whole A section again. 1, 2, 5, into the 4. Back door 2, 5, A flat minor 7 to D flat 7. 1, 6, 2, Then we get to the bridge. Starts on another 2-5 into 4. 
So it could either be a straight 2 5 a 4, or it could be played with another line cliche. So it could go B flat minor, minor major 7, minor 7, to E flat 7, A flat major. Same thing, doesn't really matter. Then we've got a 2 5 into 3, except normally the since the three chord is minor, we would expect a minor 2-5, but this is just a regular major 2-5. So A minor 7 to D7, three dominant, so 5 of 2, 2, 5, 1. Very often in the bridge, there'll be one extra 2-5. So after that 2-5 to the 3, there will be an extra backdoor 2-5 into the 3. C minor 7 to F7 before it gets to that G minor 7, C7, F minor 7, B flat 7, E flat major. And then the last A section is exactly the same as the other A section. 1, 2-5 to 4, backdoor 2-5, 1-6, 2-5. The first recording for you to check out is the Johnny Mathis pop version that was a hit for him in 1959. Then there's this really killer version of Sarah Vaughn singing it live in Sweden in 1964. She's clearly sick, she's not feeling well, and she's just drenched in sweat. But man, her phrasing is just amazing. Check it out. Then we've got some instrumental versions to listen to. There's the original version by Errol Garner from 1954 from a record called Contrasts. Then we've got a version by the killer guitar player Johnny Smith, again with Hank Jones. He's uh, becoming a recurring theme here, isn't it? With Hank Jones on piano from 1961. And then, if you'll indulge me, the version that I grew up with is this recording by my dad's trio from the 90s. It's really cool. It's an up-tempo version. It's in up-tempo three and then it goes to 4-4 four, four in the bridge. So check that one out too, definitely. The next tune we're looking at is My Romance. I've heard different horn players play it in a lot of different keys. I've heard it in B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. Uh, but the most common key is C, so that's where we're gonna take a look at it. The form of this tune is A, B, A, C. And the A section starts off on the one, walks up to two, three, flat three diminished, so that's then C major six, D minor seven, E minor seven, E flat diminished, now we're two, so D minor seven, five, one. And now we're gonna have a secondary dominant leading into the six chord. So since the six chord is A minor, five of six is E seven. Five of five, D seven, D minor seven gets interrupted by a two, five, one, and then here's our B section. We're gonna two five into the four, so G minor seven, C seven to F major, backdoor dominant. That's the flat seven. So since we're in C, we get this B flat seven chord resolving through the back door to C. Two five back into the four, F. Back door dominant to the tonic. Okay, now we're gonna have a secondary two five into the three. Remember we're in C, so since the three chord is E minor, a two five into E minor is gonna be F sharp half diminished to B seven. So that's 2-5 into 3, and we see that this 3 is really like a 2 of 2, because it's going to A7, 5 of 2, and that gets interrupted by A minor 7. This is really the 6 chord, but in this context, we're going to understand it as 2 of 5, because we've got A minor 7 going to D7. And then that gets interrupted by a real 2-5, D minor 7 to G7. Now 
Now our next A section is just like the first one. One, two, three, flat three diminished, two, five, one, five of six. So we got our E7 going to A minor. Line cliche, falling down, turns into a two five of five, turns into a real two five, and then another two five into four. So that was Right, A minor 7 to D7, D minor 7 to G7, G minor 7 to C7. And now our last section, the C section, starts on the 4, F6. Now we're heading towards the 2, so we're going to put 5 of 2. Very often the bass will walk down, so it'll say F, A7 over E d minor you don't have to though another walk down now we're going to have a two five into six often instead of the five of six you're going to have the tritone sub in order to maintain this chromatic bass line six minor four in first inversion so we just went from a minor seven F minor 6 over A flat, 1 in second inversion, so C over G, 5 of 2, A7, 2, 5, 1. The recordings that I've put on the list are the original 1934 hit version, a version of Carmen McRae singing it in 1959, a great ballad reading by Ben Webster with Hank Jones behind him from 1962. Then an iconic recording by the first Bill Evans trio again with Paul Motion and Scott LaFaro. And then a very interesting recording by Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers with Keith Jarrett on piano. Normally we think about Keith Jarrett as having recorded standards only starting in the 80s, but this is a recording from 1966 with Chuck Mangione of uh, future Feel So Good and King of the Hill fame on, um, on trumpet instead of flugelhorn, playing muted trumpet and sounding very good. The next tune we're going to take a look at is All of Me. The two keys that this tune is most commonly played in are C and A flat. The last tune we looked at was in C, so let's take a look at this one in A flat. It's in the form A, B, A, C. A section starts off on the one chord, A flat six, and then we go to the five of six, five of the relative minor, which is F minor, so five of that is C7. And then it ends up being a little dominant chain because instead of resolving to F minor, it resolves to F7, which is five of two. And that's exactly where it goes, B flat minor except it's B-flat minor 6. Normally you'd expect the 2 chord to be B-flat minor 7 in the key of A-flat. So as a minor 6, you almost hear it a little bit more as 4 of the relative minor, which is where we're heading right now. After this B-flat minor 6, we've got C7, which is 5 of 6, going to 6. This time it's F minor instead of F7. And then we go to 5 of 5, B-flat 7, and that's interrupted by a 2 chord, B flat minor 7 to 5, E flat 7. That's our A, B. Now we're back to another A. A flat 6, 1, 5 of 6, 5 of 2 to 2. And here's our C section. 4 chord, D flat 6. And then either, I prefer the minor 4 here. But it's just like this part in rhythm changes where you've got minor four or sharp four diminished, in this case D diminished, up to A flat six, one, five of two, two, five, one. The recordings I've put on this list for you to check out are the original 1932 hit version a version of Ella Fitzgerald singing in 1962 with an arrangement by Nelson Riddle, 
a very cool version from 1940 with the great guitar player Django Reinhardt and the great tenor saxophonist Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins was harmonically probably about the most advanced horn player of the 1930s. Then we're going to look at a version by the other great tenor saxophonist from the 30s, Lester Young, along with Teddy Wilson. This is a later recording from later in his career, from 1956. And then lastly, a very cool recording. It's a bootleg of Charlie Parker and Lenny Tristano practicing at Tristano's house. The next tune we're talking about is The Days of Wine and Roses. This is another ABAC form, and this is usually played in the key of F. So it starts off on the one chord, F major, and then we go to what we normally call the backdoor dominant, E flat seven, or the flat seven dominant chord. And normally that has a different derivation, but in this instance, because we're actually heading towards the six, this is the tritone sub for five of six. Right? Six is D, five of D is A, tritone sub for A7 is E flat seven. So that's what we've got going on. We've got the tonic to tritone sub for five of six, and then instead of going to D minor like we would expect, it goes to D7. That's five of two heading towards the two. So after that two chord, it heads to another backdoor dominant chord, which resolves a little bit irregularly. Normally the backdoor dominant is gonna resolve up to tonic, but in this instant, it usually is gonna go to an A minor seven chord. That's the three. Now the three is the same function as the one. So this A minor 7, we can really see this as being an F major chord that's just missing the root. And in fact, very often the bass player will play an F on this chord. So whether it's a 3 chord or the 1 chord doesn't actually matter because they're the same function, they're the same tonic function. So we've gone from that backdoor dominant to 1 or 3 usually, to 6, actually 6 minor going to turn this into 5 of 2 because we're heading towards the 2 chord, 5, that's C7 of course. Now we're going to have a 2-5 into the 6, E minor 7 flat 5 to A7 to D minor 7, and that takes us to a regular 2-5. That was our B section. Here comes the next A. So the one. Tritone sub for five of six. Five of two, D7. Two. Very often, instead of going just straight to the backdoor dominant, people like to put a backdoor 2-5 here. So they'll go B flat minor to E flat 7 to 3 again, 6. The bass walks down from D minor to D minor over C to we've got a 2-5 into the 3 now. So the three chord is A minor seven. So two of A minor is B minor seven flat five. And that's what we get. B minor seven flat five to five of three, except we use the tritone sub most of the time. So we're gonna go to B flat seven. To three, six, two. Recordings for you to check out are the original Andy Williams hit from 1963. Then there's a really great version from the Tony Bennett Bill Evans album, which is just a duo. He just sings it as a ballad straight. Then we've got a Wes Montgomery recording with an organ trio from 1963 from the record Boss Guitar. A Dexter Gordon recording from 1972. 
with the great Cedar Walton on piano and Billy Higgins on drums and Buster Williams on bass. And then lastly, there's a recording of Pat Martino, another great guitar player, playing it in 1977. Next up, we're looking at There Will Never Be Another You. This is another ABAC form, and this is usually played in E flat. Starts out on the tonic, and then we've immediately got a 2 5 into the relative minor. So if we're in E flat, the relative minor is C minor, so we've got a 2 5 into 6. D half diminished to G7 to C minor 7. And now after we hang out on the 6, we're going to have a 2-5 into 4. B flat minor 7 to E flat 7 to A flat. And now we can play either A flat minor 6, that's the minor 4, or the backdoor dominant, D flat 7. Same thing. 1, 6, 5 of 5, so F7, before it turns into F minor 7, 2. Section. Here's our next A. Another E flat six tonic. Two five into C minor. So two five into six. Two five into four. B flat minor seven into E flat seven. A flat major. Back door two five maybe this time. <laughs> One. Five of five. And then this has a slightly irregular resolution, all right? So we go from F7 to F sharp diminished, and this diminished leads towards G minor. That's the three. And then we go A flat seven. What this is is tritone sub for five of three, because we're going right back to three, five of two, two, The pop version that I want you to check out is a recording by Nat Cole from 1950. And then there's a Chet Baker recording from 54. Chet Baker was a trumpet player, but also a vocalist. Uh, then we've got an early Joe Pass recording. Joe Pass is another great guitar player, but this is an early recording of his. This is from 1956. Then a Dexter Gordon recording, the great tenor saxophonist. We've mentioned him a couple of times already from 67. And Sonny Rollins, another great tenor saxophonist. A version of Sonny Rollins playing it in 65. The next song we're going to talk about is My Funny Valentine. This tune is in A-A-B-A -A -A form and is ultimately in the key of E flat, even though it spends a lot of time around the relative minor, C minor. So it starts off with a line cliche down from the relative minor. So we We've got C minor. You could think of it as C minor major 7, but I prefer to think B diminished here. C minor over B flat. C minor 6. And now we walk down to the 4 chord. Remember we're in E flat, so the 4 chord is A flat major 7. 4 chord. 2 F minor 7. And then we've got a 2 5 back into the relative minor. D minor 7 flat 5 to G7. That's our first A section. Next A section does the same thing. C minor, B diminished, C minor over B flat, A minor 7 flat 5 or C minor 6 or really F7 because of the melody note this time. But it's still just a C minor chord with that descending chromatic line, essentially. Takes us back to the four again. Down to two, A flat major down to F minor seven. And then the F minor seven turns into F minor seven flat five. And we've got this surprise minor two five, F half diminished to B flat seven, into the real tonic. This is the first time we've heard the real one chord, the whole song. And this is the bridge where we go one, E flat major, 2, F minor 7, 3, or 1 in first inversion, really because of the melody, to 2, you could put a 5 in between 1, 2, 
one, two, five, one. And now we've got a five back towards relative minor. So we've got G7 heading towards C minor seven. Two, five to the four. So B flat minor seven to E flat seven to A flat major seven. Now we've got a two, five back towards C minor for the last A section. D half diminished, G7, C minor, so we're on the six. Seven diminished of six. Six minor seven. Six minor seven flat five, or think of it as F7 at this point. Doesn't matter. Um, again, because it's just that C minor chord with the descending line. Takes us to four, two, five, back into C minor. So that was A flat major, D half diminished to G7 to C minor. Uh, flat three diminished here of four. B diminished to B flat minor seven, E flat seven. Sometimes people will just play C minor, B minor, B flat minor, E flat seven. I kind of prefer to hear that flat three diminished, but there's a lot of options. It's not set in stone. In any case, we're just setting up the four chord. And then a final two, five, F minor seven to B flat seven, one, E flat major. And then to get back to the top of the tune, there's another two, five, back to C minor, D half diminished, G seven, C minor. The versions on the playlist are the original 1944 hit version by the Hal McIntyre Orchestra, a great version of Sarah Vaughan singing it from 1981, two iconic versions of Miles Davis playing it. The first one with his first great quintet from the album Cookin' from 1955. We've already heard the first great quintet a little bit. And then another version that is very much more abstract from the 1964 My Funny Valentine record. This is four-fifths of the second great quintet with Herbie Hancock on piano, Tony Williams on drums, and Ron Carter on bass. Also, George Coleman on tenor sax instead of Wayne Shorter, who would complete the second great quintet. I love George Coleman, too, though. Don't sleep on that record. Finally, a version by the Keith Jarrett Trio from 1986. The next tune we're going to look at is How High the Moon. This is an A-B-A-C form and is normally played in the key of G. And kind of the thing with this tune is that it's going to go back and forth between the key of G and the key of G minor. So it touches on a number of different key centers. It touches on the flat 7 and the flat 6 as well as the parallel minor. But that flat 7 and flat 6, they both come from the parallel minor scale. right? Because if you think about G major, the, the parallel minor is G minor. And so the flat seven, F major, and the flat six, E flat major, both come from that parallel minor scale. So let's take a look at this tune. Starts off the A section on the one chord, and then we go to a two five to the flat seven. So G minor seven to C seven to F major, F major seven. And then that repeats down, heading towards the flat six. Now we're going to have a two five towards E flat, two five into the flat six. And now a minor two five to G minor, that same minor two five, but surprise to G major this time. So that was A half diminished to D7 to G minor 6, then A half diminished to D7 to G major 7. 3, B minor 7. B flat 7 is the tritone sub for 5 of 2. And then 2, 5, that was our B section, back to 1 for our second A, G major. G minor 7, C7, 2, 5 into the flat 7, F major 7, 2, 5 into flat 6, 
E flat major, that was F minor seven to B flat seven into E flat major seven. That same minor two five, A half diminished to D seven, but into real G major, into the major tonic. So that was a surprise minor two five into major tonic. Two, five, and then that same three, tritone sub for five of two, Two, five, one. The versions for you to listen to are the original Benny Goodman hit version, which is in C, or the first chorus is in C, and then the vocal chorus is in E flat, and then the out chorus is in D. So none of those are the normal key. Uh, but these original pop versions are often in different keys than the jazz keys that ended up establishing themselves later. Next up, we got a version of Ella Fitzgerald singing it in 1947. Then a cool version by the Nat Cole Trio. So far, we've only heard Nat Cole in the context of being a pop singer, but he was also a fantastic piano player. So this is a version from his trio, which is piano, guitar, and bass. That was a popular format for a little while in the 40s and 50s. That's from 1946. Then we've got a couple of recordings of a Charlie Parker contrafact on How High the Moon called Ornithology. First of all, there's a killer recording of Bird playing it from a record called One Night at Birdland. This is live at Birdland with Fats Navarro on trumpet, Bud Powell on piano, Curly Russell on bass, and Art Blakey on drums. And also a recording by the great Barry Harris, a trio version from 1958. The next tune we're going to take a look at is Like Someone in Love. This is in the form A, B, A, C, and even though in the real book it's in E flat, so you're commonly going to run into it being called in E flat at jam sessions, probably because John Coltrane recorded it in E flat. The more common keys are A flat and C. Horn players tend to want it in A flat, and piano players, particularly in the Bud Powell tradition, tend to want it in C, although Bill Evans played it in F. Today we're going to take a look at it in A-flat. Starts off on the one chord, A-flat major 7, and then immediately we've got a 5 of 6. Remember the 6 chord in A-flat is F minor, so 5 of that is C7. A-flat, C7, F minor. But the bass player is generally going to connect that with a walking line. And what that does is it puts the fifth of that five of six chord in the bass. So that takes it from one to five of six, but with the fifth in the bass, so it's in second inversion. C7 over G takes us to F minor, that's the sixth chord. And then the bass keeps walking down. So we could see this chord as being either the six chord in third inversion, F minor seven in third inversion, or the one chord in second inversion, A flat six with the fifth in the bass. So it's either F minor seven with the seventh in the bass, or A flat six with the fifth in the bass. It's the same chord, doesn't matter. But then after that, it goes on to the five of five in first inversion. So that's B flat seven, but with D in the bass. Usually in a chart, if you're reading a chart in this key, you would say D minor 7 flat 5. But if you know Barry Harris harmony, you know that D minor 7 flat 5 and B flat 7 are really the same chord, right? D minor 7 flat 5 is just the chord that you find on the third of B flat 7. So that's 5 of 5. And then this next chord is really interesting because it's D flat diminished. So if you just look at it on the face of it, all right, so we're in A flat, so here's a diminished chord on the four. But what this really is, is it's a five chord missing the root. Okay, it's really E flat seven, flat nine, but it's got a D flat in the bass. Sometimes people will even play it as an E flat triad over D flat, but that's what this, chord really is. It's a dominant functioning chord, and then it goes to the three chord. So normally we would expect five to go to one, right? 
and <clears throat> we know the three is a tonic substitute, so having this diminished voicing of the five chord fall down to three makes perfect sense. And then after that three, we've got five of two. That takes us to two, five, one. And then we've got a two five into the four. So we're gonna have E flat minor seven to A flat seven to D flat major. There's our four. Now we've got a two five into the six, but the six is gonna be major. So G minor seven, to C7 to F major 7. And then that's going to turn into a 2 5 towards the 5, F minor 7 to B flat 7, and then turn into a real 2 5 to finish off this B section, B flat minor 7 to E flat 7. Then we've got a repeat of the A section 1, 5 of 6 in second inversion. 6, 1, or 6 still, again, we don't care, 5 of 5, 5, but this special voicing of it where it's missing the root, and it's got the 7th in the bass, more like that, to 3, 5 of 2, so that was again B flat 7, D flat diminished, or E flat over D flat, to C minor 7, F7, back to our 2, B flat minor 7. Very often here, there's going to be a tritone 2 5, a tritone sub 2 5. So the 2 chord, B flat minor 7, and the 5 chord is E flat 7. So what's a 2 5, a tritone away from that? E minor 7 to A7. So very often, you're going to hear guys after this 2 chord play this 2. Five, a tritone away into the real one, and then our two five into the four again, two five into the major six, and then normally we would look at this as being the flat three diminished. This is B diminished seven, but the flat three diminished normally is going to go to two. So this chord is actually the 7 diminished of 3, because we've got B diminished resolving to C minor, F7, 5 of 2, B flat minor, 2, E flat 7, 5, 1, A flat major. The pop recording on the list is Bing Crosby singing it in 1944. Then there's a great version of Sarah Vaughan singing it in 58. Then we get to the instrumental versions. First of all, there is a recording by John Coltrane from 1957. This is a pretty historically significant recording because he's playing in a trio without a chordal instrument. This would become a very popular, or a very, a relatively common context going into the 60s and forward, but this is one of the earliest recordings I'm aware of, of that context. Then we've got a great recording from 1963 of Ben Webster playing with Joe Zawinul on piano. We all know Joe Zawinul from Weather Report, but this is him playing in the 60s, just playing straight ahead acoustic jazz piano. Sounds great. Uh, and then finally, a wonderful recording of Barry Harris playing it live in Japan in 1976. The next tune we're looking at is Just Friends. This is another ABAC tune, normally played in the key of G, but this one starts out on the four chord. So we're in G, we're going to start out on C major 7, and then we're going to have a backdoor 2-5, so C minor 7 to F7 into the 1, G major 7. Now we're going to have our flat 3 diminished, B flat diminished. We've got a 2-5, A minor 7, D7, 1, G major 7, 6, E minor 7, A7 is 5 of 5, and then that's going to turn into 2, A minor 7 to D7, and then G7. 
to set up going back to the four chord for the next A section. So very often it'll go from that D7 to D flat seven to C major seven. That's just the tritone sub for five of four. It doesn't have to do that. It could just go from D7 to G7, five to five of four back into the four for the start of the next A section. Another backdoor two five. Backdoor two five one, because it gets back to G. Very often, instead of the flat three diminished here, people like to put a two five. They like to, instead of saying B flat diminished, they like to reconceive of that and say, all right, so B flat diminished could be an upper extension of E flat seven. What two chord goes in front of E flat seven? B flat minor seven. So instead of B flat diminished, which is still really the core of what the chord is, they'll put in the sub B flat minor seven to E flat seven, and then two, five, three, six, and then this quickly turns into five of two, which is interrupted by five of five, two, five, one. And then we've got to turn around back to four to get back to the top of the tune. The pop version of Put On is a hit by the Russ Colombo Orchestra. And then the jazz vocal version is by Chet Baker. And then for the instrumental recordings, we've got a version with the string section from Charlie Parker with strings. This is a very classic recording. Then a Pat Martino recording from his solo debut from 67. This is in an organ trio with Trudy Pitts on organ. And then lastly, a quartet version from 1972 of Sonny Stitt with Barry Harris backing him up. Next up is What Is This Thing Called Love? This is an AABA tune, and the thing that makes this one kind of tricky is that it starts so far away from home. So this is ultimately in the key of C, but it starts off with a 2-5 into the minor 4. So the very first chord is G minor 7 flat 5, going to C7 to F minor 6, so that's a 2-5-1 in F minor, and then D minor 7 flat 5 to G7, so that's a minor 2-5 that surprise resolves to major tonic. So that's what I mean by we start pretty far away. We start on the G half diminished, 2-5 into F minor, 2-5, minor 2-5, surprise finally into C major. Now the bridge, we've got a 2-5 into the flat seven, so C minor seven to F seven, B flat major. Then the next chord is the tritone sub for five of five, A flat seven. We've talked about this before, I think, in another tune. This is a real bluesy chord. This is very commonly used in a minor blues. But then after that A flat seven, we've got a two five, D half diminished, to G seven. And then that unexpectedly turns back into G minor seven flat five. So that's an interrupted 2-5 that turns into a 2-5 back into F minor for the last A section. And then finally another minor 2-5, D half diminished, G7, resolving back into C major. Sometimes the 2 chord in that last 2-5 is going to have the 5th in the bass, or you could look at it as F minor 6 with the 3rd in the bass. To G7, to C major. For the instrumentals, first up, we've got a contrafact on what is this thing called love by Tad Dameron called Hot House. The recordings House. that I put on the list for you are the original by pop Parker recording by the Leo Reisman Orchestra from 1930, and then a Billie Holiday recording from 1945. Now for the instrumentals, first up, we've got a contrafact on what is this thing called love by Tad Dameron called Hot House. And this particular recording is by Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Then we've got Clifford Brown, Max Roach Quintet with Sonny Rollins on tenor. Absolutely killing. 
And then finally, a Barry Harris recording from 1975. The next tune we're going to look at is On Green Dolphin Street. This is another A-B-A-C tune, normally played in the key of E-flat. Even though the real book chart is in C, it's normally played in E-flat. So my theory is that it's the same issue as how the real book chart for Autumn Leaves is in E minor instead of G minor. I think an alto sax player wrote that chart in the alto sax transposed key and forgot to transpose it back to concert. Because remember, the alto sax key is a minor third down from concert. So if the concert key for Green Dolphin Street is E flat, the alto sax key is C. That's my personal theory on why that chart is in that key in the real book. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We're going to play it in E flat. Everyone plays it in E flat. Starts off on the one chord, E flat six, turns into the parallel minor, E flat minor. Now these next two chords, a lot of people think of as modal, but they're really not. Okay, E flat with an F over top of it makes an F7 chord. What's F7 in the key of E flat? Well, it's five of five. And then, where does it go to? That F chord comes down to an E over E flat. This is, if you want to call it, that it's E major 7. But let's take a look at why is this E chord here. Well, what's the tritone sub for 5? Remember, we just had 5 of 5. And then now it's heading to tritone sub for 5, back to 1. So there happens to be a tonic pedal in the bass. If we took away that tonic pedal, we'd have 5 of 5, tritone sub for 5, 1. On some older recordings, you'll actually hear people play 5 of 5 to 5, back to 1. But anyway, so that's why we've got this E major 7 chord here over E flat. It has nothing to do with E flat Phrygian at all. This is just five, and because the tonic is still in the bass, that makes it a major seven. So even though it would normally be a dominant seven, we play it as a major seven. And then it goes back to tonic. And then for our B section, leading into our B section, there's a quick two five into two. So G half diminished to C7. Now we're on F minor 7. This is the beginning of the B section. 2, 5, 1. And then we've got a 2, 5, 1 up a minor 3rd into the flat 3. A flat minor 7, D flat 7, G flat major. So what's the relationship of that G flat major, that flat 3, to the tonic? The relationship is the parallel minor chord. Remember we went from E flat major to E flat minor? Well, the relative major of E flat minor, G flat major, that's the flat three chord. So that's what we do, we've got our two five into the flat three, and then a two five back home, another A section. One, parallel minor, five of five, tritone sub for five, except it's major seven because of that tonic pedal, remember, back to one, another two five into the, the two, so that's G half diminished to C seven, now we're going F minor, the bass walks down, this is the two, walks down and gives us a two five into the relative minor, into six, and then now the bass walks down again, and we're going to have a 2-5 into the 3, A half diminished to D7, and then 3, G minor 7, 5 of 2, C7, 2, 5, 1. By the way, that 2-5 into the 3, sometimes a bass player will play F7, 5 of 5, to F sharp diminished. 7 diminished of 3 into 3. But look at the... Whether it's got A to D in the bass, or F to F sharp in the bass, is immaterial. It's the same thing. 
As far as recordings go, we've got a recording by the Jimmy Dorsey Band from 1947, and then a Carmen McRae recording from 1970, the great Carmen McRae. As far as instrumentals, there's an extremely iconic recording by the Miles Davis Sextet from 1958. When I was growing up, this record was called 58 Sessions, or Miles 58, 58 Miles, something like that. Nowadays, it's mainly uh, released as a bonus disc, second disc on Kind of Blue, but I knew it as that 58 Miles. Those recordings are great, by the way. Next up, we got a version by the great Sonny Rollins from 1965, and finally, a version by the Keith Jarrett Trio from 1986. The next tune we're looking at is a really important ballad, Body and Soul. This is an A-A-B-A -A -A tune, usually played in the key of D-flat. The A section starts on the two chord, E-flat minor. Depending on if you're in the 50s or in the 60s and forward, you're going to make it either E-flat minor 6 or E-flat minor 7. Either way, we're going to alternate with its dominant chord. So we're going from 2 to 5 of 2, B flat 7, back to 2, and this time it goes to 5, A flat 7, and then moves on to 1. And then this next chord, it can either be 4, just regular 4 major, or you could also make it a dominant chord. And the reason you can make it a dominant chord is because we're moving to the 3 chord, F minor 7. And the, the 5 of F minor 7 is C7. And the tritone sub for C7 is F sharp 7. So we can play this F sharp 7 to lead into F minor 7, lead into the 3 chord. From the 3, we go to the flat 3 diminished. E diminished with this moving note. And then we go to the 2 chord, E flat minor. Bass note walks down until we get to the two chord with the sixth in the bass, which ends up being C minor seven flat five. Check this out, this is really a two chord into B flat minor. So we're gonna say C half diminished to F seven. This has been a two five into six. And then finally a two five back to one. And a five back to the two. So that was E flat minor, E flat minor over D flat, C minor seven flat five to F seven, B flat minor, E flat minor seven, A flat seven to D flat major. And then at the end of this first A section, since we're going to repeat the A section, we've got to head back towards the two. We've got to head back towards E flat minor. Remember the five of E flat minor is B flat seven. into E flat minor. And then we repeat the A section. Two, five of two, two, five, one, four, or tritone sub for five of three. It's really better. To three. Flat three diminished. Two, walking down to the two of six, five of six, Six, two, five, one. And now the bridge goes up a half step. So we're in D flat, the bridge is in D. So we're gonna have a two five into D. E minor seven, A seven, here's our bridge. D major seven, we've got a one. And then the real chord is just five, but usually we play two here. Uh, the real basic changes on the bridge are just to go back and forth between the 1 and the 5 of D. But obviously that's way too bland, we're not going to play that. Usually we're going to play 1 to the 2, 3, 
three, four, I like minor four here, and then a quick three, six, two, five. Really two of, five of two, two, five, one. And then we're gonna, this D major is gonna turn into D minor. We're gonna have a two, five towards C, which is the flat seven. but then it turns into three, flat three diminished, again in C, so E minor seven to E flat diminished, two, D minor seven, G seven, C seven, B seven, B flat seven. All right, what's up with that? We know at the end of the bridge, we've gotta be heading back towards the two chord, which is E flat minor. Five of E flat minor is B flat seven, okay? So we're heading towards that E flat minor, but we're heading there via this B flat seven. Now we get into this B flat seven by, check this out, C seven, that's five of five B flat, right? We'd expect to hear five of five of B flat to five of B flat, so now it's five of E flat minor, and that's where we end up heading. That's where we end up heading. The only difference is we don't put an F7, we put a B7. Why do we put a B7? Because it's a tritone sub for F7. So now we've got, this is five of five B flat of B flat, tritone sub for five of B flat, into B flat, but oh, check it out, it's actually five of E flat minor. And then our last A section is exactly the same. Two, five of two, two, five, one, tritone sub for five of three, three, flat three diminished, two, bass walking down to our two, five, into six, than our real two, five, one. And since we're gonna be repeating the A section again next time around, we should really play a two, five heading back into E flat minor. So that's how we're gonna turn it around to get back to the top. The pop version that I've put on the playlist is actually the first recording that was ever made of this tune. It's by the Jack Hilton Orchestra from 1930. And then there's a great version of Sarah Vaughan doing it solo, playing piano behind herself as well as singing uh, from 1974. Now we've got three recordings by great tenor saxophonists. First of all, an extremely iconic recording by Coleman Hawkins from 1939. This is really the definitive recording of this tune. Then there's a John Coltrane recording from the 60s where he reharmonizes it pretty substantially, puts almost the whole A section over a dominant pedal and then the B section, he also reharmonizes substantially with some giant steps type major third divisions of the octave. Finally, there's a recording by Dexter Gordon from the 70s where he incorporates some of those Coltrane reharmonizations, but only some of them. Also, he takes a really nice unaccompanied solo cadenza over the changes at the end of this recording. Next up is the venerable Cherokee, beloved by beboppers worldwide. This is an AABA -A tune, usually played in B flat. Starts on the tonic. And then we've got a two five into the four. So the four chord in B flat is E flat. So we've got F minor seven to B flat seven, two five into that four, E flat major. Next, we've got E flat minor. So we go to the minor four. A lot of times bass players are gonna play A flat here, make it a backdoor dominant. It's the same chord, but if you listen, cats in the 40s tended to play that E flat in the bass, 40s and 50s. And then moving forward, more modern guys tend to play the A flat in the bass. Either way, I tend to like E flat minor, but they're both good. And then back to the one, B flat major. Five of five, C7. Then we go to two, this five of five is interrupted by a two. 
C minor, go to 5 of C minor, G7, 5 of 2, 5 of 5, to 5. And then that's our first A section. We repeat it. 1, 2, 5 into the 4, 4, minor 4. we go to 5, 1. Now the bridge, just like body and soul, goes up a half step, but instead of starting on the 1 up a half step, we start on the 2 of the key up a half step. So we're in B flat. So the bridge starts with a 2-5 into B major. C sharp minor 7, F sharp 7, to B major 7. And then a 2-5 down a whole step from there into A. And then a 2-5 another whole step down into G. Two five another whole step down. Which is interrupted by a real 2-5. That's the bridge, taking us back into the A. Five of five, two, five, one. So really the main challenge of this tune is the fact that it's going by so quickly. It's generally played at a relatively fast tempo. And even though the changes get to some disparate key zones, compared to the key of B flat, B major, A major, and G major are pretty far away, right? They're the flat 2, the 7, and the 6 major. None of those are related to B flat in particular, but you could make an argument that G is kind of related to B flat through its relative minor, but those are really pretty far removed keys from the tonic, and again, the tempo is going by pretty quickly. That being said, they're just two fives. We know how to deal with two fives. So it's really not that difficult to tune. Again, like I said, it's just because we play it so quickly. There's a possibility for it to get away from us. That's all. So as far as recordings are concerned, we've got the original Ray Noble recording from 1938, and then Sarah Vaughan singing it with Cannonball Adderley in 1955. Then we've got an incredible recording by Charlie Parker called Coco. This isn't actually Cherokee. It's not really a contrafact on it because it's got a whole different melody section that's unrelated and has different harmony. But then when they get to the solos, they're blowing on the changes of Cherokee. And it's just an amazing recording. Charlie Parker in his prime, dizzy on trumpet, just really killing. Then another amazing bebop recording, Bud Powell in a trio setting from 1950, just burning on it. And once again, just absolutely burning the Clifford Brown Max Roach Quintet recording from 1955. On our list is The Song Is You. This is another AABA tune generally played in the key of C. Starts off on the tonic, C major 7, goes to the flat 3 diminished, E flat diminished, to 2, C minor 7, G7. The original change in these next four bars is C major 7, 1, to 7 diminished of 2, C sharp diminished, to D minor 7, 2, 5, G7. Generally, instead of 1 to 7 diminished of 2, we're going to play 3 to 5 of 2. So instead of... Um, play E minor 7 to A7 to D minor 7. Another 3, 5 of 2, 2, 5. Here we've got a backdoor 2, 5, so F minor 7 to B flat 7. A section starts off the same way. One to flat three diminished. 
left to two. times people are going to put a 2-5 into the 4, but we're going to save that and talk about it in the last A section because it's exactly the same as the way it happens in the last A section when people sub it in right here. And then we've got another 3, 6, 2, 5, 1. And then you can either just hang out on the 1. I like to go to the minor 4 here. And now the bridge is in the key of the three. So we've been in C this whole time. The bridge is all going to be in the key of E major. In the original, it just plops straight there from C major to E major. Most jazz musicians are going to put a 2-5 into the E, though. So after we end up on the C major, we're going to put F sharp half diminished to B7 into E major. So now we're in E, we've got a 2, 5, back to the 1, and now a 2, 5 into 3, again still in E, so the 3 is G sharp minor, that means a 2, 5 into that is going to be A sharp half diminished to D sharp 7. sharp minor. We're going to have a little dominant chain here. End up on C sharp 7, which is 5 of 5 of 5 in E, because we're heading towards F sharp 7. That's 5 of 5. And then finally, a 2 to 5. back into C for the last A section. A lot of times, though, people are going to put some extra two fives in there. So after that, right, we're on our G sharp minor, that's three in E, and we get to that C sharp seven. Going to go to C sharp minor seven to F sharp seven, make it a two five. Again, make this F sharp seven into F sharp minor seven, make it a two five, and then put a quick D minor seven to G seven, real two five, taking us back into C. This last A section is going to start off the same as the first two, but here the melody jumps up to F instead of jumping down to F. So we're going to have this high D minor 7 to G7 again. Here we've got a 2, 5 into 4, so G minor 7 to C7 to F major minor, three, five of two, two, five, one. And again, some kind of turnaround you're going to play depending on whether you're going back to the top of the tune or you're going back to the bridge. If it's a ballad, you'll probably play it just going back to the bridge. If you're playing it up-tempo, it's going to go back to the top. The pop version I've put on here for you to check out is a Jack Denny recording from 1933. And then we've got a classic Sinatra recording from the 50s with a great arrangement by Nelson Riddle. As far as instrumental recordings, there is of course the classic Charlie Parker recording with Hank Jones on piano. I want to point out something that Hank Jones does. Every time there's a 2-5, he does this little trick. Not every time, not every single time there's a 2-5 in the tune. But in the A sections, when it's going 1, flat 3 diminished, normally it goes 2, 5. If you look at that 2 chord, the 3rd 
is in the melody. And so Hank Jones does this little trick. When you've got the third in the melody of a two chord, you put an extra 2-5 up a half step from there. So instead of just playing D minor 7, G7, whoever's playing the melody still hangs on to that F, but you make it E flat minor 9 to A flat 13 to D minor 7 to G7. So it ends up sounding like this. was that second A section with the 2-5 into the 4, which is a common thing to play. So you just got to listen real closely to the bass player, or if you're the bass player, you got to listen closely to the piano player, or if you're either the bass player or the piano player, you got to listen closely to the horn player and see what harmony they're really implying, and that's what you want to play. The next recording we got for you is Art Blakey with Sonny Stitt on alto and McCoy Tyner on piano. McCoy is generally known for playing these modal fourth That's by no means all that McCoy does, and on this recording from 1964, he's playing pretty straight ahead. Finally, we've got a great solo guitar recording by Joe Pass from his classic Virtuoso album. Also, it's not on the list because unfortunately it's not on YouTube at the moment, but I would be remiss if I didn't point out one of my very favorite recordings of this tune. That's by the Keith Jarrett Trio from 1986, the album Still Live. Just an incredible, epic performance. Number 22 on our list is Someday My Prince Will Come. This is an A, B, A, C tune, and it does admittedly have kind of a lot of chords, but if we investigate and think about each change for a second, we should be able to see that they're all perfectly logical. So this is generally played in the key of B flat. Starts on the one. And then immediately it goes to the 5 of 6, 5 of the relative minor, which is G minor in this key. And instead of resolving to G minor like you would expect, it has a deceptive resolution, which remember in a minor key means you're going to go up a half step to the flat 6 chord. And in G minor, that flat 6 chord is E flat. If you think back to the key that we're really in, B flat, that's the four chord. So we have the one, five of the relative minor, resolving into the four. And then check this out, it goes to five of two. This is exactly the same movement that we just had, except in the key of the four, right? Because in the key of the four, the relative minor is C minor. Right, from E flat, the relative minor is C minor. So the 5 of C minor is G7. And that's exactly where it goes. So we had 1, we went to 5 of 6. That resolved deceptively to 4. And then that moved to 5 of 2. Which, again, that 2 is like the relative minor of the 4 we were just on. But now we go to actual 2. Go to it's 5 again, G7. Now instead of going back to 2, we're going to say 5 of 5. Go into 5. So that's our A section. Now the B section starts on the 1 chord in first inversion. So this is a B flat over D. Or like B flat 6 over D. Goes to flat 3 diminished. To 2. Do that again. One in first inversion. Flat three diminished. Two. Five. Back to one. Now we've got another A section. One. Five of six. Going to four. Five of two. Back to two, five of two, again, five. 
five of five instead of two this time. To five. And this five is interrupted by a two five into four. Four. Sharp four diminished, which is again, we've talked about this before, but that is the tonic diminished. It's a common tone diminished on the tonic, and that's exactly where it leads to. It leads to the one, but with the five in the bass. And finally, two, five, one. First recording on the list, I'm sure you've all heard, it's from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the Disney movie. That's where this tune originally comes from. And then we've got a version of Lena Horne singing it on TV sometime in the late 60s. For instrumental recordings, we've got the iconic version by Miles, which has a very nice solo by John Coltrane. Then there's a real nice version by Sonny Stitt with Don Patterson on organ. It's the same organist from those other Sonny Stitt with organ trio records, the one with Gene Ammons and the one with Dexter Gordon. And that's from 1965. And then there's a recording by Bill Evans' final trio from 1979. In the late 70s, Bill Evans had finally kicked heroin, and he had a young, hungry new trio, Mark Johnson on bass and Joe LaBarbera on drums, and he was really playing a lot of piano that last year or so. Number 23 on our list is one of my very favorite tunes, All the Things You Are. This is an AABA tune that is generally played in the key of A-flat, although it does visit quite a few other key zones. When I was first starting to play jazz, I remember my dad told me something to the effect of everything you need to know about jazz harmony can be found in all the things you are. Or if you learn all the things you are, if you can really play on all the things you are, you can play anything. And it really does cover a lot of bases, at least in terms of traditional functional jazz harmony. So it's in A flat, but it starts on the sixth chord, F minor seven, and it's gonna fall in diatonic fifths. So from F minor seven, down a fifth in the key is two, B flat minor seven. And then down another fifth in the key is five, E flat seven. Down another fifth is to one, A flat major. Down another diatonic fifth, we end up on the four chord, D flat major seven. And then this is kind of interesting. We've got a surprise minor two five, into major three. That's going to be a recurring theme, the minor two five into a surprise major chord. Now the next A section repeats that exactly, except it transposes it down a fourth to be in the key of the five. Whole song's in A flat, five of that is E flat. So we're going to repeat that entire phrase now in the key of E flat. So six, two, five, minor 2-5 into 3, and that 3 is G major. Remember, we're in A flat, so G major is now a half step down from the tonic. And the bridge is in the key of G. 2, 5, 1, and then there's going to be a 2-5 into 6 but it's another one of those surprise minor 2-5 into major 1. This is actually the 6 in relation to G. But then we're immediately going to put the 5 of F minor to get back to our last A section. So that's 5 of 6 back in our original key. Final A section starts the same as our first A. 6, 2, 5. where it changes. We're going to go to minor four now. Three. Flat three diminished. Two. Five. One. Finally. And then if you're playing another chorus, you're going to have to two five back into F minor. 
pop version that I've put on for you to listen to is an Artie Shaw recording with Helen Forrest singing from 1940. And then the jazz vocal recording is a great recording of Carmen McRae singing it in 1972. For instrumental recordings, there's a contrafact. It's actually not really a contrafact. It's just Charlie Parker blowing on the changes of all the things you are. There's not really a melody. It's called Bird of Paradise. That's from 1947 with Miles on trumpet. And then we've got a great Barry Harris trio recording from 1959. And then finally, someone who hasn't made it to this list yet, but who I like a great deal, and who has recorded this tune many, many times. But this is a killer trio recording of Pat Metheny with Roy Haynes on drums and Dave Holland on bass from 1990. I also want to mention there's a very commonly played intro and outro on this tune written by Dizzy Gillespie as kind of the spoof of the Rachmaninoff prelude in C-sharp minor. You know, the one that goes... <laughs> up in you end up hearing that in popular culture different places i remember when i was a little kid i first heard that when harpo marx played it in the marx brothers movie a day at the races and the piano was falling apart around him because he was playing so hard uh anyway so the intro to all the things you are goes like this d flat seven to sharp nine to c seven to sharp nine So C7, obviously 5 of F minor. All right, the D flat 7, we could look at as just being a chromatic approach down to that C7, or you could see it as being a tritone sub for the 5 of C7, which is, of course, G7. All right, tritone of G7 is D flat 7. So we've got D flat 7 going to C7, going to F minor. That's also kind of like a minor blues, right? We've got the flat six dominant of F minor to five dominant of F minor going to F minor. There's a really funny recording of it by Charles Mingus from the late 50s called All the Things You See Sharp, where he keeps the vamp from the Rachmaninoff piece going and puts the All the Things You Are melody on top of it. Really hilarious. All right, we're getting very close to the end of the list. Tune number 24 is Stella by Starlight. This is a really interesting tune. It's generally played in the key of B-flat, and it's not quite a through-composed form. It is a 32-bar form, and the first phrase and the last phrase are clearly related. So you could call it A, B, C, A prime, but it's not an A, A, B, A, or A, B, A, C form, like you usually find in a Great American Songbook tune. So we're in the key of B-flat, and if you look in a real book or a fake book of some kind, the first two changes that you're going to see are E half diminished to A7. Going to the 2. Five. Now, at first glance, that doesn't make very much sense, but let's examine where that substitution comes from. So the original chord change is a tonic diminished, going actually straight to five. That's a little bland, but check out what we're gonna play here. This is what Bud Powell plays, this is what Barry Harris plays. This is beautiful. A flat three diminished, and that flat three diminished falls to two, like we expect it to. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna reharmonize that flat three diminished. So we're gonna say, all right, D flat diminished. Well, that's the same thing as B flat diminished. All right, well, B flat diminished is like an upper structure of A7, right? So what two chord goes along with A7? If A7 flat nine is the five chord, we're looking at the key of D minor, right? So that's gonna be E half diminished to A7. So whichever way you want to play that is fine. I'm kind of partial to hearing that flat three diminished. Falling to the two. I think that's just really beautiful. 
but most everyone's going to play, if you just call the tune, every bass player is going to start on E. Right. So that explains how we get from that 2-5 in D minor to a 2-5 in B flat, and it really making sense, not just being kind of random. Through that flat 3 diminished. Okay. So anyway, after we got our 2-5, we're going to have a 2-5 into the 4. E flat major, and then make it a minor 4. E flat minor, back to 1. B flat major. 2-5 into 3. That actually goes to 3. We're going to have a backdoor 2 5 into 5. 5 in B flat is F. So the backdoor 2 5 into F, B flat minor 7 to E flat 7. And now this is the surprise. It's going to be F major instead of F7. Back to that 2 5 to 3. But that gets interrupted by a 2 5 into 6, A half diminished to D7. And then instead of going to G minor, the 6 chord, it goes to G7, flat 13. This is borrowed from the 2, from C minor, and that's where we're about to go to. There's our 2. Minor 4, or very often it's going to be the backdoor dominant, A flat 7. Now we get to our last section, which is a sequence of minor two fives. We've got a two five into three, which is suddenly a two five of two. And then that goes to two, but it's half diminished because this is a surprise minor two five. And that's the form. The pop recording we've got is an early Sinatra recording from the 40s, from 1947. And then we've got a great version of Sarah Vaughan singing it in 1962. The instrumental versions are first up Miles' 58 sessions. Again, that's you're mainly going to find that as the bonus disc on Kind of Blue reissues, but when I was coming up, that was called Miles' 58 sessions. It's all the same guys as Kind of Blue. It's Bill Evans on piano and Cannonball on alto, and Coltrane on tenor, Paul Chambers on bass, and Gene Cobb on drums. Then there's a cool recording by Grant Green, the guitar player Grant Green from the mid-60s. This has got Hank Mobley on tenor, and it's got the great, great organist Larry Young. He was a very forward-thinking, modern kind of organist, doesn't play anything like Jimmy Smith at all. And then finally, a great recording by the Keith Jarrett Trio from 1985 from the album Standards Live. All right, now we have finally gotten to the last tune on our list. This is Have You Met Miss Jones, an A-A-B-A -A -A tune typically played in the key of F. The real challenge of Have You Met Miss Jones comes in the bridge, where Richard Rogers has these modulations moving in major thirds, dividing the octave into three equal portions. Just like Coltrane and his Coltrane cycles from the late 50s, but this tune is written in 1937. So that means that this tune precedes Coltrane's major third cycle tunes like Giant Steps, Countdown, 26-2, and Satellite, or the bridge, his reharmonization on the bridge of Body and Soul. This precedes all of those tunes by well over 20 years. So let's dig in. The A section start off on the tonic, F6. And then we're going to have a 2-5 into the 2. So that means A half diminished to D7 going to G minor 7, so here's our 2, 5, and then 5, instead of going to 1, it's going to go to 3, 3 to 6, and the normal change here is just 2 to 5, but players, particularly from the bebop kind of side of things, like to put a 2-5 up a half step here, so after the A minor 7, minor 7, we like to say A flat minor 7 to D flat 7, G minor 7 to C7. 
So like I said, that's just a 2-5 up a half step. There's our first A section. And the second A section proceeds much the same way. One, two, five, into two. A lot of people will just play F sharp diminished here, seven diminished of two. And that's an okay option, but don't feel like that's what you have to play. The real change is a two, five. a 2-5 into the 4 to end this second A section. Here comes our bridge with our major third cycles. So we've got our 1 in B flat, which is the 4, and now we're going to have a major third down, 2-5 a major third down to G flat. So A flat minor 7, D flat 7 to G flat major. have a 2-5 down another major third into D. And then a 2-5 back up a major third to G flat. And then finally a 2-5 back into F. So let's think about that for a second. So those three key centers we've got are B flat, G flat, and D, then back to G flat before finally ending up back in F. So what are those key centers, what are those key centers relationship to F? B flat is the four, G flat is the flat two, Major six. So if we think about that, we've got a two five into four, a two five into flat two, two five into six, two five back into flat two, and finally a two five back to one. And our last A section is a little bit different from the first A sections. So we start on the one again. Very often the bass player, halfway through this one chord, is going to go to the four, leading down into that three, or really two five of two. Two, five, but now we're going to walk down, check this out, B flat so seven. thing on the list for you. What the hell is B flat seven strings, doing in the key like of F? Dennett. Well, we're about to head and then we've got a nice recording toward this Joe A minor Williams. 7 chord. Joe Williams is so a singer B flat that was seven primarily associated is the tritone with sub Basie for 5 of 3. Uh, this is a recording right, from A minor, 5 of A minor is E7, and then we get tritone of E7 recordings. is B flat 7. So there we go. 5, tritone sub for 5 of 3, and then we end up with 3, 6, Two, five, one, just like you would expect. Anyway, so we've got that five, five of three, triton sub for five of three, to three, six, or five of two, two, five, one. All right, so first thing on the list for you is a nice ballad recording with strings by Tony Bennett from the mid-70s. And then we've got a nice swing-in recording by Joe Williams. Joe Williams is a singer that was also primarily associated with the Count Basie look of the Real Nice intro. Uh, This is a recording from 1961. As for instrumental recordings, first up is a version by tenor saxophonist Illinois Jaquette from 1956 with Roy Eldridge on trumpet. Roy Eldridge was a major influence on Dizzy Gillespie, and Illinois Jaquette is sort of mainly known for playing these honking, kind of proto-rock-and-roll, one-note kind of solos. And so it's nice to hear him playing on some changes, on some real changes. And he sounds great. Uh, so does Roy Eldridge. It's beautiful how simple he plays on it. Uh, that works just wonderfully. Next up is a trio version by McCoy Tyner from his first record as a leader, Reaching Forth. And even though the record's called Reaching Forth, he doesn't really dip 
too much into his sort of chordal pentatonic bag. He's really just playing on the tune. Sounds great. Roy Haynes on drums, Henry Grimes on bass. Really great recording, really burning. And then finally, we've got a nice kind of medium up swinging version of Kenny Barron playing it in a trio in the mid 90s. If you managed to make it through that whole list, congratulations and thanks for sticking with me. If everything I talked about in this video more or less made sense to you, then you're now pretty well equipped to learn any standard. If you really have internalized all of these movements, which is to say you really know what it sounds like to 2-5 into the 4, or to 2-5 into the 6, or wherever, how the backdoor dominant sounds resolving up to the tonic, how the flat 3 diminished sounds resolving down to the 2, etc., you should basically be equipped to learn any standard by ear without needing to find or trust a chart. Now your homework is to listen to all five versions of each tune. Pay attention to how differently different musicians can sound on the same tune. Try to listen to the small and sometimes major harmonic differences from player to player. I'd also recommend listening to at least five more versions of each tune that aren't on the list. I also can't highly recommend enough taking these tunes through different keys, always thinking in terms of the Roman numeral. I'm looking forward to going in depth talking about improvising on each one of these tunes in their own videos soon. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you don't miss them as they come out. If you have any questions about anything, just leave a comment below. Also, be sure to let me know in the comments what you think about the recordings on the playlist, and also what some of your other favorite recordings of these tunes are that didn't make it onto the list. If you're interested in taking some private online lessons, please send me an email at billgrammusic at gmail.com. My book, Chord Tone Improvisation, is available in a physical edition on Amazon and as a PDF on my website. I'll leave links for those in the description. Thank you for watching. Take it easy, and I'll see you back here again soon. Thanks.